Hello everyone, it's a great pleasure. I have to say that this is one of those wonderful occasions to talk to someone very competent, knowledgeable on the most important matters of the 21st century that we have been enjoying over the last two, three months at Vitautas Magnus University. So this is one of the conversations in a series of our program, I would say intellectual academic discussion series about what's happening in the world. Needless to say, what is really urgent and very, very important nowadays is human rights issues, especially when they go together with such difficult issues and problems as terrorism, and safety, insecurity, uncertainty in our days. And I think that we are very, very privileged to have someone very, very knowledgeable, Mr. Mohamed Pasmina Akunji, who is a lawyer, who is an expert on political terrorism, and I suppose a very important human rights defender at one at the same time. And um, my first question would be what it means to be a lawyer and a human rights defender at one at the same time. So people normally would assume, especially in this part of the world, that being a human rights defender means to be a dissenting person, a dissenting mind. I think this is something very, very strongly embedded in Central Eastern Europe, that we know that someone who raises her or his voice against oppression, so should be someone who tackles very difficult challenges. But at the same time, you're a person who defends law. What it means to try to combine all of those things? Well, it's very kind of you to introduce me in, in this fashion. Um, it, it is an interesting position to find oneself in, to be defending people accused of terrorism, but then also being somewhat active in the discourse around issues of human rights. But they're not that dissimilar. Um, in terms of the purpose of lawyers who defend people who are accused, the ultimate purpose is to be a check and balance on government, to stop it become fascistic really, to make sure that despite whatever an individual is accused of, that they are given the full rights uh, as an individual human being, so that the organs of state aren't used in an oppressive fashion against them, and by extension to everyone else who may be accused in future. Um, the reason for activism in terms of human rights is fundamentally, as a society of, or a global society, we have to have some sort of common ground, something which we can all agree on. And one of those fundamental things is the fundamental principles of human rights that governs us internationally. It's the reason we can expect from our enemies um, a discourse where we say there's a limit to how we negatively engage with each other because we have these common principles. And that's why it's so important to defend those principles, especially at a time when we have such intellectual conflict and physical conflict as well. Yeah, and at the same time, I think what strikes me is that, well, you know, nowadays when many people try to portray the world black and white, so they think that you should be on the right camp and you should be defending your values and ideas against someone else's camp. Being a lawyer, you have to engage very actively with people whom you defend. And so it happens that people whom you defend they happen to be described as terrorists or people who have to do with it. So what it means to be empathizing, trying to understand and defend people who have very difficult past or very difficult, difficult experiences and how to oppose this propensity to portray the world black and white when we know that it is much more complex. Well, I mean, um Thankfully, we live in a world where there's um, communications technology now, and every individual has the ability to, to look at the world around them, an opinion about what they see. And that's been very important. It's a seismic change on the planet. It's what's led to um, you know, the Arab Spring changes of government. And the reason for that is that we can see the illegitimacy in, in those who control or power brokers when they try and paint the picture that this is the enemy and this is wrong and this is us and we are good, when we see the hypocrisy in it as well, historically and also you know, currently as well in, in many cases. So this is uh, an important question, um, but also in an in interesting time in terms of technological context, because it means that our, our leaders and power brokers are held much more to account nowadays in the public sphere than they have been in the past. And so in terms of defending people, we can get the idea of nuance and empathy because most people are not irrational actors. Uh, 
they act rationally given their circumstance. And often it's important to um, not allow the perspectives of shutting down examination of a person's context or a, or a group's context and looking at the reality behind what the true motivations are. Now, unfortunately, in the, fi in the field of terrorism and, and uh, extremism, um, most of this is cloaked under the guise of national security or um, secrecy, really. And it is our job to say, well, okay, it might be important that certain things are covered by, are kept secret or are uh, not appropriate to be released in the public. But we, it takes lawyers to be the regulators about where that mark is. Um, how much of that debate needs to be out in the open to stop illicit practices by government, which is frankly more damaging to society than small groups acting in a, uh, in a, in a violent fashion occasionally. Mr. Kunji, let's try to tackle some, some challenges and let's try to destroy some cliches that are quite widespread in Europe. So one of the cliches suggests that people who are engaged in terror activities, they're all fanatics. They're all single-minded fanatics, but we know that, you know, it's a very, very naive perception. We know that many people who have some difficult experiences or who are engaged in terror activities are very, very far from being irrational or fanatic. We know that this has to do with many things, failed states. This has to do with geopolitics. This has to do with very difficult colonial past in Europe. So how to how to broaden this picture? Because we know that one of the stereotypes and not to say quite primitive superstitions widespread in Europe is that, you know, people who come to Europe are very angry and very bitter and then hate us, they hate Christianity. And of course, it's a very naive perception as if to say that the world is divided into, you know, good and bad, you know, evil and good. How to explain, how to deal with this? Because this naivete is not innocent. We tend to forget that terrorism has very, very deep roots in Europe. It's not about Islam. We used to have the Red Brigades in Italy, which was communist terrorism. We had terrorism in Ireland, which was, if I dare to say, Catholic and not Muslim. So meaning that, you know, this sort of very, very strange abuse of words and concepts is really disturbing and quite telling. And how do you oppose this? Well, I mean, you ask the public to open their eyes and use rationale, really. Um, in terms of the debate, it seems that people are fearful of refugees coming to Europe. But there's a reason why they're coming to Europe, is because they want freedom and democracy. So the idea that um, people who are running towards democracy are actually angry at democracy is counterintuitive. It doesn't actually make any sense. Um, the Arab Spring, which has happened in Tunisia, Egypt, and you know, ongoing in Syria, that was a movement for democracy against tyranny. So we see that the populations in the Middle East are clearly you know, willing to lay down their lives even for the opportunity to be represented in a democratic fashion in their own countries. What then happens is you have a reaction of tyranny from the existing leadership there who then frankly you know massacre them kill them and destroy their homes so these people who want democracy and freedom have nowhere to go because their own homes have been destroyed and and these are generally people who have lived in the lands for thousands of years not even hundreds of years they've never moved because they want to they've moved because they have to and the direction they've moved is towards progression so that is a matter of fact the problem is is that um, we have media narratives and maybe some political narratives that uh, exist to try and re-spin it into the opposite direction. And it's just a question of people being critical in their, in their approach to information, really, to critically examine propaganda and to look at the facts and reasoning behind it in truth. Uh, Mr. Kunji, what is the role of poverty and religion in the structure of terror? I think that those things are linked to one another somehow. And there are some disturbing complexities. We know that some organizations that are described in the West as terrorists, like Hamas, for instance, they were functioning as charity organizations in the Middle East. And that's why they could have been perceived in a very, very different way using vis-a-vis -vis the way that we tend to perceive it in Europe or the United States. On the other side, the role of religion. Well, something tells me that I wouldn't buy a story about Saddam Hussein and Iraq where Ba'ath Party, which was known for its agnostic, not to say atheist views, all of a sudden would become fanatic overnight. Indeed. Yep. I mean, <clears throat> it, it's, a, it's the crucial question. 
in terms of the media narrative, what is the role of religion. And the current thinking in the UK, or, or, and certainly in other European countries as well, is the theory of conveyor belt theory of uh, extremism, which is that people become religious and then because they become religious then they move along uh, up and up the chain of aggression or violence and then they, and they become, uh, some small portion of them become terrorists. And this is a theory that's been totally debunked through research and uh, from academic papers, but somehow continues to subsist within the political thinking and reactions. But <clears throat> the reason for that may be because when terrorists explain their actions, they justify them according to, in the Islamic world, what appears to be religious justification. But this is misthinking. So when we examine it uh, as a whole, a total global look at this, when we, the, w the Western world, engage in violent action, we reference the justification for that against legal tradition. So domestic and also international. We say because of international law, um, this is a state's right or the population's right to defend itself and to have its own governorship. So because they're under oppression, international law says that we can support them. We're justifying our action of military intervention according to international legal standards, which tend to be Eurocentric. In the Eastern world or in the Arab world, their laws are based on different principles, but they're just law. So it's called Sharia, but it's based, it's the legal structure that is commonly understood in the Arab world. So when they engage in behavior that's violent in nat nature, they try to justify it legally by reference to their law in the same way that we do. Um, but because their law is more couched in sort of religious terminology, because it draws its legitimacy from that, it appears that they are religiously motivated. In fact, not. All violence is always justified according to legal traditions of where people are coming from. And that is the misthinking around this. You were defending young people, who, you were working with young people who, uh, who decided to go to fight for the ISIS. And I imagine how difficult and how disturbing it is to have young souls, you know, young people who are trying to do something. And, and honestly, I'm just trying to imagine the whole thing and the reason behind it would be very, very difficult to explain. What is disenchantment, bitterness, a lack of integration, lack of understanding on our side, or some sort of failed biographies? <clears throat> I mean, there, there is research around this, and um, the research doesn't give any one clear factor. Um, the most common factor which indicates whether someone will go somewhere or not is whether their friendship circle, anyone from that has gone. So it's quite a, it's an issue to do with bonding, really, rather than any one given factor. But in terms of why people go, there is, there, there is indications of disenfranchisement and what have you. But actually when we look at the core impetus, the reason why they even start looking at it, it's usually empathy. It doesn't really matter which group they've gone to. And we have many people in the UK who have gone to Syria to fight, but not with Daesh, against Daesh, against the Islamic State. And we don't, we don't tend to look at them. We tend to look at people who have, who have joined as a, as a threat. But it's the same impetus for all. They see, they see dead babies on their TV screens in the news, and they see the failure of the political class to deal with the situation over, you know, in Syria five years and in Iraq many, many years. They see, you know, just further, further death, further, further oppression. And because of the failure of our politics to solve the problem, um, they feel somehow some of these individuals that they can make a change, at least to go there and save one life or another. On that, after that impetus, they then make the decision to make the journey, and that necessitates joining one group or another, because it's a war. So depending on which group they join, then their thinking then diversifies into the common parlance of that particular group. But the original impetus is actually one of empathy. Mr. Akunji, if I could ask you something about geopolitics, because I think what is important is that we know academically and theoretically that many terror groups, they proliferated or they were given, you know, much strength during the Cold War. And it's quite obvious that you know what happened in Afghanistan or nowadays in Syria. So I think was that during the Cold War, those players like the Soviet Union or the United States, they needed their actors and their proxies, so to say. Yes. And that's why when we know that there is a very, very dangerous situation when they need a sort of no man's land at the playground, when they can you know, test the ground <coughs> concerning how far they could go, 
when we know and we see what's happening in Syria in terms of Russia and America and NATO just trying you know, to settle their old and new accounts, what is the hope left for the real genuine fight against terror or the genuine fight for the human souls trying to save them from this? help, so to say. <laughs> well, I think it becomes the human cry in the end that enough is enough. In the end, uh, human beings will always rev revert back to their sense of justice, their sense of what is right and what is wrong on an individual level. And we all know that the situation in countries that are collapsing, it's wrong to allow it to continue. But the problem is, as you've identified, not just the old guard of the Russian-American dynamic, but also we have new issues that are quite recent where we have the uh, in the Arabian experience the rise of the Iranian power bloc versus the uh, Arabian power which tends to be a bit waning in the region so we have cross dynamics on one level and then cross dynamics on another level and then we have the emergence of Turkey as a somewhat minimum uh, minimalistic superpower as well so incredibly complex um, but, but in, the, in the end, the failure of that state will lead to more and more trouble, as we have seen. Um, and the politics behind it will be that people will see what this is, and are seeing what this is, and will examine um, and acquire facts. And in the end, hopefully, we will tell our governments that this is, this is unacceptable. And they're feeling that pressure now. Um, in the UK, we're having a debate. Across Europe, we're having a debate. Do we put ground troops into Syria or not? Is this acceptable? Um, even in 2006, the, before ISIS and all of these uh, narratives, we had a very simple narrative, which was that Bashar al-Assad was killing his own population, and this was unacceptable. And so the debate about whether to attack him militarily was had. But because of our experience and negative experience with Iraq, the population wasn't, wasn't willing to commit its troops because it didn't trust its governments. Um, now we know that the situation has diversified and got worse. You know, and because it's got worse, we, we think of intervention, but populations are still not happy with military intervention. The fact is, is that as our political class lies to us, we will lose trust in them and therefore we uh, fall into inaction. So it falls back on our, politi our politicians to regain credibility, and that takes time. They have to desist from lying, you know, start telling the truth, which might be uh, something of a, a new concept for politicians generally, and then, to, uh, and then to actually make good on their promises. It's credibility is the issue. And without that, we don't have domestic, we don't have domestic security and we don't have international global security either. It has to be based on facts. What is the role of some criminal networks in this uh, very difficult situation concerning terror in Europe? We know that what happened in France or Belgium had to do with some, uh, with some young people who were affected by, by prison, by, by you know, the prison entourage, so to say. And is it accurate enough to portray the whole thing as more related to a criminal network which tries to misuse and abuse religion rather than, you know, something, you know, something fanatical, something, you know, religious based. Well, I mean, I think religion does play a part in this. Uh, it would be wrong to say that it, it has no feature whatsoever, but religion is being used as a sort of recruitment device, a justification device, rather than the actual reasoning itself. Um, and criminal networks in terrorism will always be the case. Where, where terrorists are trying to commit a criminal act, which is mass murder, it's crime. And so by definition, they need to bring in resources that are illicit to be had, explosives, guns, and what have you. And they will rely on these networks to bring them in covertly. So actually our strongest response to terrorism is a strong um, intelligence gathering exercise in criminal networks. Th that is the best chance at avoiding terrorist acts anywhere. But, you know, as I say, terrorists are rational actors. They're, they're responding to a situation as criminals are on the whole um, rational actors. They're looking at poverty, they need more money, so, and they don't have uh, the options to get it, so they become criminals to just take it. And terrorists, they need to make a political point, even though they're so powerless. They're so small on the, on the world stage, so they have to engage in extremely uh, sensationalist behavior in order to make their point. Now, the simple solution to both is, one is detection, but also it's to re remove the impetus. If people don't have the gripe, they, don't, they feel they're being heard and represented, uh, 
then they don't need to engage in such acts in order to get attention. So the answer has always been dialogue. And in the UK, we had the IRA situation, which was uh, you know, separatist, um, that mainly Catholic-based sort of terrorists who were um, against the British government's encroachment in, in Ireland. And, and that arguably was a festering problem for over nearly 100 years. Um, and it was only solved by dialogue. It was only solved by talking to these groups and addressing their concerns and negotiating a peace. And ultimately, our governments are there to secure us, to give the greatest amount of happiness to the greatest number that are under their jurisdiction. And part of that is security. And right now, even though most of us have a very, very small threat wherever we live against terrorism, we don't feel secure. And that is a failure of government. I think it's vitally important that you mentioned the absolute priority of the dialogue, you know, the need for a dialogue. I remember there was a curious episode when I was listening to the interview, and the inter it was George Schultz. At the time, he was the State Secretary of the United States, and he was interviewed, and he was blaming uh, some of American policymakers for having approached Jerry Adams. <laughs> he blamed saying that, how can you? So the question is, what side are you on? But you say that it's critically important to engage and to have a dialogue, otherwise there is no single chance to do something about it. Well, when we have a, when we have a, a poisonous atmosphere, um, the, the, the debate or international geopolitical debate is quite similar to a, to a, to a bad marriage, really. So uh, where, where you have um, poisonous intention there in the atmosphere, then anything that one side does will always be misinterpreted in the most negative way by the other side. And we have very quick escalation of hostilities. When we have dialogue through mediators as well, then we can remove the worst of that, emoliate against the worst of escalation. And the, and the issue is, again, always political. It's not, it's not something that can't be solved. What is very important is that you mentioned that terrorists are rational actors. They're very far from being, you know, lunatics, fanatics, you know, so they could be very rational. What is that something that makes them rational? What is the purpose? If not the single purpose, then at least, you know, some complexity or something that motivates them. Is it about how to discourage some countries from some actions on the ground? Is it how to intimidate or to... I mean, it, de it depends on the group and it depends on the particular circumstance. So, for example, if we look to the to the first cousin, I guess, of uh, ISIS, we go back to Al-Qaeda. And Al-Qaeda were almost entirely rational and actually explained themselves during the course of their, their hegemony in the, in the regions that they operated in. And Bin Laden was quite clear. He said, why do we not uh, attack Sweden? It's because Sweden has absolutely nothing to do with the war on terror in Iraq at the time in Afghanistan. So, um, after that statement, uh, he identified a number of countries that were engaged in operations in Iraq, and one of those was, was Spain. Um, and so we had the Spanish uh, train bombings, which were a uh, horrendous, horrendous um, uh, tragedy, really. But it had exactly the desired effect that Al-Qaeda wanted, in that you had a right-wing government who were engaged in, in troop uh, movements in Iraq. Um, after the, uh, the, the explosions were three days before the elections in, in Spain, and then straight after that, you had a complete change of government. The population had no appetite for engagement in, in Iraq whatsoever. They went to a left-wing government, and within a month, they'd withdrawn their troops. And since then, Spain has remained, remained safe, frankly, from these issues. So it, it's quite basic stuff, really, in that if you are engaging in an actual fight in a foreign matter, then there will be a sort of pushback response. It's, um, it's the law of reaction, really. Um, and in terms of, but with ISIS, there's a slightly different um, approach here. And it's not because they have a single particular um, desire I in terms of Iraq and, and the, uh, and the uh, Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. Their desire was the removal of troops from Arab land, so American bases to, to, be, to be expunged out of um, Arab territories, whereas ISIS are a state-building exercise. They, they wish to establish a state, and that is a much more complex uh, issue with, with, with an unknown end to it, really, whereas with the Al-Qaeda position, there was a clear end. If you, this happens, then there'll be no more Al-Qaeda, whereas if, uh, if anything happens in terms of world affairs, <coughs> ISIS still want to maintain a state.
Now, the nature of that state, what that is and whether it can be engaged with, depends on a, they, their behavior, but their behavior is much dictated about what our behavior is towards them as well. So we'll see a few years ago, uh, three or four years ago, there was an uh, article in, 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 in The Economist, and there's a debate. Uh, do we deal with ISIS uh, as a state now, because they have a de facto control, or do we continue to deal with them um, as terrorists? And much, much of their more extreme behavior of you know, cutting off heads and the Charlie Hebdo attacks in, the, in France and Belgium and what have you, the, these have happened since a decision globally not to deal with them on a negotiated basis, not to deal with them as a state. So, uh, you know, other people's behavior are in our hands as well in terms of how we deal with them. Mm -hmm. It sounds very convincing and, uh, and I believe that in fact if they try to affect the public opinion in Europe so they could be successful and they are successful in, in so many ways. <coughs> but the problem is that, Mr. Akunji, what if they have something opposite. For instance, what if they bring semi or even fascist government in France, like Marie Le Pen and Le Front National, or something like Hert Wilders and the Freedom Party in the Netherlands? How does it benefit their cause? If they have far-right government, Islamophobic, hostile, nearly fascist, does they benefit from this? Well, I mean, they do, yeah. <clears throat> and the reason they do is because they're state building. So if, if we look at uh, the Cambodian... They live in and they... Not just an enemy, they need population movement as well. So when, when one is building a state, then they are calling on people to join their state. They need human beings to live there. So, for example, in terms of Israel, that's not a particularly comfortable place to live. It's always been in a bit of, bit of conflict. But I Israel's policy is to call on Jews from around the world to come and live in Israel because it's a state and it wants a, a population there. And so the so-called Islamic states are engaging in the same exercises to call people from around the world on, a, on an Islamic basis to join their state-building enterprise. So, um, so th that is their policy as a, as a, as a fledgling nation. Uh, it's not a very attractive policy, given that there's an all-out war um, uh, are taking place there, but some people are listening to that call. Uh, what could be said about this, I would say, theatrical, sometimes grotesque cruelty, you know, I mean, you know, this capital punishment and, you know, being displayed in a very awful way. Is it about intimidation, the spread of fear, or there is another message behind it? I mean, this is manipulation. Um, in terms of the laws that govern that land, they're almost identical to the laws that govern Saudi Arabia, which tend to be an ally of the, of the West. So th there's not much difference there. But the, but the taking it further into the more grotesque sort of um, in media savvy way that they have is there as a manipulation in terms of how you govern public opinion in Europe and America. And they are, they are expert at this, expert at this. So um, what they've managed to do is to cause attention to themselves and also a negative reaction um, in terms of bombing. And actually, this is what they want. In Cambodia, we had Pol Pot. And initially, when he started, he only had, what, 5,000 troops. But after the Americans started bombing Cambodia, he had 250,000 troops within a year. Because the population see, uh, when they, they are being killed, that the machinery left after the bombs and the uh, shrapnel have made in America written on them. So then they look around. Who, who has killed my family? Who's killed my wife? Who's killed my child? Who built, built this bomb? Well, the Americans did in Cambodia, and so they look to whoever the leader is to fight back against America, and so they joined Pol Pot, terrible dictatorship. And actually ISIS are engaging in exactly the same exercise. The more people bomb them, the more they get troops and uh, sympathy on the ground. So they are happy to burn their international reputation in order to get domestic power, and that is the exercise being engaged in here. And this brings me to my central question, my pivotal question about Lithuania. So because the title of our, our conversation is the likelihood of, is, of Islamist terrorism in Lithuania. So Lithuania is a small country. So the Baltic states are quite small. Roughly all Baltic countries put together, I think would be something like half of London, you know, meaning that small countries and, you know, it's a small spot with very dramatic history, very happy to have joined the West in terms of accession to the EU and NATO and many things and we don't have our turbulent history with elements of colonialism or imperial power and of course this is a great contrast between such overseas empires and powers the way Great Britain, 
or the Netherlands or France mm -hmm. where. So what is the likelihood, Mr. Akunji, that there would be some sort of, you know, trouble, problem or threat in countries that are, you know, in their perception, you know, in the middle of nowhere? I mean, um, my, my opinion about this is exactly in accord with Lithuania's security services and briefings to its own government, which is next to zero. Um, for a number of reasons. One, as you say, uh, there's Professor Ratchus, he's, he's looked at the historical context and the internal context of, uh, of, of, uh, of Lithuania, and his opinion is in accord, which is that it doesn't lend itself to any sort of you know, terroristic groups, really, uh, fostered here. And that's entirely correct. There is no colonialist past, and if we look at the individual actors who committed um, terrorist acts in other countries like France, we find that they are from um, ethnic communities that have some grievance on a colonial basis against the host country. So, you know, Moroccans and Tunisians in, in, in France, in the UK you have some uh, people from Asian descent. It, it's always the people with a historical grievance because terrorism or terrorists need to convince people to do terrorism and in order to do that you need to give them a reason for do it, doing it and therefore you look at the historical context. But, you know, um, in Lithuania you have a uh, long history to do with uh, the successful integration of Muslims into this country from the 1300s, you have the Tatars. Um, and so there is, there is no grievance there, despite the war on terror starting in 2000. There has been, in, in fact, the, I think the only terrorist attack in Lithuania was against an Iki store in 1998, really, and that was on a, uh, no one group claimed that, and it certainly wasn't Islamic in nature perhaps against the prices, maybe, that they were charging. But, uh, but uh, yeah, that, it's next to zero. As long as, the, as, long as Lithuania as a country stays um, in, its, in its limited role in the NATO sort of operations in effectively Afghanistan and Iraq, it's not, it's not seen as a, as, a, as a target. And on top of that, it would be somewhat embarrassing for terrorist groups to attack the smaller countries. Their purpose is to appear to be able to strike large targets on the world stage, if, which gives them legitimacy, gives them sort of power in their region. If they start hitting the small countries, then they look like they're weak as well, and that's not their purpose. I see, but at the same time, I think that there is some sort of, you know, vicious circle in our reasoning. I mean, Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians, we have long been very, very unsafe and secure, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Russia, a big neighbor. So and now, of course, many things have changed and we are all EU and NATO countries. But still, after what happened to Crimea, after the Russian-Ukrainian war, the Baltic states felt threatened. And that's why they are asking, you know, for more American and NATO presence in the region. And again, needless to say, you know that the logic is quite simple, that whatever happens with NATO, so the Baltic states would be obliged and motivated to participate. If, God forbid, something happens on the ground, meaning that it's very easy to predict what would happen because the Baltic states would be happy to be perceived as staunch allies of NATO. Mm -hmm. And then this could change the entire perspective and the attitude. So you are NATO country. Sorry, guys, nothing personal, just business. You are there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, th th that was a similar type of reasoning used by uh, in the Nuremberg trials as well, in terms of, you know, we're just following orders. Um, th there, is, there is the price of conscience, really. And in, in the, at the final analysis, yes, the risk of uh, you know, Russian aggression must be balanced with the risk of um, domestic terrorism uh, as a target if one were to commit, effectively on a friendship basis, the, the Americans and the Europeans want to go into into Syria that, you know, if we commit a bunch of troops to that, then we become slightly more of a raised profile in terms of domestic terrorism. But, but that is the political question, and that is always a difficult question. The, the fact is, is that um, politicians must factor in that risk appropriately of domestic terrorism, and f really they need to put resources in the smaller countries into assessing that threat properly. Because w what we've seen in, in Lithuania is very early on, um, a lot of rhetoric about uh, Islamic terrorism and what have you, and then the allocation of seven million liters very early on to to deal with an existential threat that never actually appeared. So, um, of that resourcing, there was, as far as I know, uh, almost no resourcing for the academic examination of the trends or threat assessment. 
basically. So we have a lot of money put into actual machinery, but not a lot of money put into actual reasoning and thought and research. So the, the, balance, the rebalancing of that would be a sensible approach before decisions or geopolitical decisions are made that might uh, affect domestic sort of security. Before I go to the Q&A session, before I ask the audience to come up with questions, I would like to put the last one. Um, and this is a question not to a lawyer and an expert, but rather to a humanist, a human rights defender, Aleppo, which has become a symbol of, I would say, complacency and moral blindness of the world, meaning that the city was bombed, and then we perceived the whole thing as just a battleground between Russia and the United States. And does it say something disturbing about moral blindness of the world? People are being bombed, being attacked, and you know, and we think in terms of some sort of technical, you know, something technical rather than existential or moral. I mean, the, the whole Syrian debate is, is uh, somewhat morally embarrassing, really, for um, sort of Western concepts of human rights, really. Um, the reason is, is that this problem in Syria was happening uh, long before we became aware of it. And it was festering in Iraq. Um, there was a Shia Sunni sort of uh, tit-for-tat violence which then spread over into Syria. And we didn't really pay that much attention to it. Um, it's only when the refugee crisis burst out of Turkey, when Turkey became saturated and started affecting sort of, uh, sort of European countries, Hungary and what have you, that's when we really started paying attention, when it directly affects us. Um, so morally that's a you know, big question mark about the, the scenario. But also that we have doublespeak on the issue. We, originally we were looking in 2006 at the moral situation for those individuals who are being slaughtered really by Assad. And, and the fact is, is that the people in the region are still being massively um, slaughtered by Assad, less so by ISIS. But our disproportionate focus is on ISIS and not really on the behavior of Assad. So we really need to re-examine these things and look at um, the UN um, position on it, Amnesty International's position on the, on the situation. And if we are saying that we are moral operators, then we have to appropriate blame and reaction to that um, proportionally, and we're not. Thank you. Well, the time has come for you, dear colleagues and friends, to ask some questions or to have some comments here. Yeah. Uh, my name is David. I'm from a law faculty of this university. During uh, your experience, have you ever um, experienced any uh, pressure or intervention from the, uh, let's say, prosecutors or government institutions uh, while you were defending um, a suspect, let's say, uh, accused of serious crimes or uh, even terrorism. So if you have ever experienced um, such intervention, how you dealt with that? Mm -hmm. um, on the whole, no, is the answer. There was one situation where um, another legal office that we were working with, because in the UK we have solicitors and barristers, so we, have, um, we, we, we are the solicitors who prepare all the cases and the barrister's office go off and, and actually present the case. But we had a, we had a situation where there was a break-in um, where an individual smashed a window, went into the office and picked up a file, which was a rather sensitive file, and they were looking for notes. But thankfully there was, there was nothing in there that, uh, that, that, that was uh, contentious or difficult. Um, but that was the only particular experience. On the whole, we deal with quite a lot of sensitive issues. There's no, there's no pressure from our governments to, uh, to look at things one way or another. Okay, some more questions or comments? Yes, the microphone here, please. My name is Ira Musali. I'm a student from Social Work Department. And I'd like to ask of, about a system of government, the impact of a system of government that is expanding all around the world now called democracy and which is uh, a part to the people and and the impact it having on a third world nation that is uh, that don't really have a democratic background and which i i was listening to um donald j trump where in his poly, foreign policy statement he said that over the years, America has um, embarked on a journey of propagating their democratic values and also imposing some of these values on um, nations that 
have their own values and and if you also see that in some of these western countries that practice the same system of government especially in europe europe have what they call the identity and some of my lecturers call it europeanness and even as deeply they have accepted democracy they've not um, ignore or reject, deny their identity. And in most of the African countries and Middle East countries, one thing they have, um, the problem they have is opposing their identity. For example, as an African person, trying to tell me to ignore my values, my core values as a country, and ignore my culture, and accept your own culture. I want to see, I want to ask you, sir, the impact of democracy ever since the inception of this system of government all around the globe. What, the, what can you say about that, sir? Mm. Well, <clears throat> yeah, I think um, it's an interesting question, certainly, and it's one that's relevant to the time. But in terms of democracy, there are many different models. It's not one system. It's, it's a concept, which is that every person has a right to have a say in who their rulers are. And, you know, the biggest democracy in the world is India. You know, th th that has n no country has a history of democracy until democracy actually comes to it. So when the Greeks put it together, they had it for a short period of time, and then they chose to go for dictatorship afterwards arguably more su successful as a nation under dictatorship than they were under democracy. So, you know, it's a thing for the time. Uh, in terms of culturally, yeah, the, there are many different issues to do with um, the monarchies, tribal systems that don't lend themselves to the easy functioning of democracy. But we have the same thing in the UK and we still have a monarchy. You know, technically speaking, I guess the UK is under religious rule um, in that every law that's passed has to be passed by the Queen, despite whether, whether or not uh, politicians have, uh, have, uh, have agreed it. She tends to agree it. She hasn't changed her mind in 600 years. Um, but, um, but, uh, but technically speaking, she gets her authority from anointment by God in church, really. So bizarrely in the UK, we have one of the oldest democracies, but we also have the oldest subsisting monarchy. And if we look at the constitutional issues there, that's, that's somewhat um, you know, difficult, really, contradictory. Uh, but that's how that democracy functions and has been exported. In France, we have a very different experience with that. We, there is no monarchy there, it's a republic, and people represent their position in a much more traditionally, uh, scientifically demo democratic fashion. Um, in India, they have nearly a billion people there, and that seems to function. But in the Middle East, those people who are ready for their, for their time, they will take it. It's n systems of government, even under international law, it is the right of individuals to determine how they choose to be governed. It is not to be imposed on them from outside. That is hegemony. And, and we've seen that. We've seen that where, let's say, America wishes to export democracy to the Middle East. Um, maybe they tend to avoid you know, Saudi Arabia at the moment because they... They, they, they have a, a kingship there with a, a large resource that's quite important. So the problem becomes, well, if people don't want to be governed in a particular way, they have to make that clear and resist uh, imposition of that system, you know, with argument, but also it's their right to do so with their arms. You don't see that these things also have uh, in, uh, part to play in resulting to act of terrorism. I don't think so. Uh, I, I think really terrorism is uh, more to do with a political expression uh, and it's about the oppression of an outside force imposing something, not necessarily democracy. I mean in Afghanistan we saw people engaging in terrorism because they were resisting communism and that's not democratic. So um, you know it, it's about outside forces trying to impose their will against a local will, not necessarily the system that is irrelevant really about what's being imposed. It's the fact of imposition that's important. And my question, I think, if I may assume the right of the very, very final question. So, I think it would be fair enough to say that, you know, you try to combine many important things and many important competences here. So as a lawyer, as a human rights defender, as an expert, but honestly, I was in the human rights field myself, and I know one thing that 
you can hardly expect to be very, very popular, you know, among power structure people when you defend the people who are being described as, you know. So that's why my question would be, does it make your life any easier? Keeping in mind the fact that, you know, you have to challenge police, their competence or incompetence. You have to challenge sometimes, you know, security people. And those folks are not awfully happy about being challenged or tackled. So that's why I realized that, you know, you're testing the ground. and. And this tells something about your profession. Is it difficult to be a lawyer who works with people the way you do? It, it certainly doesn't make you many friends, um, but it's always helpful to be on the right side of history. And that tends to be on the right side of morality. Now, governments come and go, um, but those that are remembered are the ones that did something great on the basis of truth. So in terms of advice to others, always be on the right side of truth and be a decent person. And in the end, it will be you that uh, sways the day rather than whoever's on the wrong side. Um, in terms of government and how they uh, behave towards myself, frankly, we have quite a professional relationship. I understand that what governments are doing is difficult. They're balancing very difficult choices. And for policy reasons, they do one thing or another. Yeah. That, that is their role and their job, and I, I hope they're doing it well. And from an outsider's point of view, I point out when I think they're not doing it so properly. From security services, they're doing their job. And actually, I think there is some recognition that I, as a lawyer, am doing my job as well. Um, so there is more of a professional relationship and dynamic there than there is a personal one. So um, we, we can speak cordially, and tea is involved, usually. Well. With this, I just wanted to wrap it up, thanking the audience, thanking my colleagues who advised me on having a wonderful person, a wonderful, a wonderful lawyer on board. And I think that we learned a couple of lessons today. That on the first, on the on the first hand, I think that what is very important is to understand that nothing is easy and nothing is obvious in this world. So we live in in the time of disturbing complexities. And this applies to many, many issues. And the second lesson is, of course, moral courage, decency. Decency, moral courage, being able to talk on behalf of the truth, the truth itself. For this lesson, I thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, and it was a pleasure.